and we see, and we see the years just rolling by, you know, so fast the days are passing. Before you know it, you already will be in the middle of the year. You know, it's so fast. Why? Because Jesus is coming back soon. Everybody knows that he's coming back soon and sooner than you think. Sooner than you think. And he's not just coming uh, for a, a church that is lukewarm. He's coming for a church that's on fire for him. And that fire, I'm going to speak about that fire this morning. Okay, hallelujah. The fire of his word. He's coming back for a passionate, word-loving church. So word-loving church is that he's coming back for. Okay, I want you all to do a little bit of exercise. Can you all just rise up to your feet, hold your Bible in your hand. We're going to make a passionate declaration of in faith of the word of God. Can you just rise up whether your Bible is in, in the form of your handphone or your iPad or whatever. We're going to make a, a declaration, a faith declaration. Slide two, please. Just follow after me as, a, as, as we have it on the slide two. That's the faith declaration for the word of God. Because this morning my message is on the passion for the word of God. And I want you to say passionately and with faith declare, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am changed by the incorruptible word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we just tell, thank you this morning, Lord, for your word to our hearts. Father, even as I expound the word of God to your people, Father, that it will not come in the wisdom of man, but it will come in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Let your word establish us, Lord, this morning. And let it not return to you void, but let it accomplish the purpose for which you have sent it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Help us to have discerning hearts. Help us to have receptive hearts. Thank you. We praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Last night I had very little sleep because this side, the, my neighbor's Chinese, and in front of a few Chinese houses. And in the middle of the night, I was just I was thinking, I'll just have a little snooze before I go into the, you know, preparing the message. I mean, I already prepared, of course, on Saturday, but I wanted to go through with that. I was just thinking of doing that and have a little snooze. Suddenly, the firecracker saw it. It was so noisy. And, you know, I asked my, my Chinese friend, why do they put firecrackers? And, you know, and they said, um, to chase away the evil spirits. Okay. But praise God, we don't have to chase away evil spirits. They're putting firecrackers. We have the word of God to chase the devil. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now let's just look at the title and subtitle this morning. Can I have slide one? So I, I, my title is Just Speak the Word. Just Speak the Word. And then my subtitle is, according to the theme, uh, Passion for the Word of God. Authentic Passion. Authentic Passion for the Word of God. Okay, and then my text is from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. Keep your fingers in the book of Jeremiah, okay? It's in the Old Testament. Okay, here. Yeah. We will not go into the text yet. I want to just give you a little briefing about the, what is the meaning of, uh, I mean, what, why we say we need to have passion for the word of God. We need to know. See, every Christian should have four Spiritual passions in their life. Four W's. Passion for the passion for worship. Worship includes prayer. Passion for the word. Passion for the work. Work meaning service, Christian service unto God. And passion for the world. All the four W's we should have 
as Christians, these are the four spiritual passions that we should have. Worship, word, work, and world. What I mean by world? Passion for souls. What I mean by work? Passion for the work of God. Hallelujah. Okay, let's see. Can I have slide three, please? Um, okay. You may, you may want to know what is authentic. Authentic means genuine. Genuinely, you must love the word of God. That's the meaning of authentic. Authentic passion means genuine, true, real passion. Passion means what? Intense desire. You have a great desire, a great devotion towards, a, towards something or someone. In this case, we're talking about the word of God. Intense desire, intense uh, thirst. Hallelujah. Hmm? So here, passions can also be natural passions. People have natural passions also. Like our sister Lillian, she got passion for stray dogs, correct? <laughs> and then I am, uh, you know, uh, we have, I'm talking about natural passion. Huh? My natural passion actually is reading. I always, from the small time of a small girl, I just love to read uh, story books, romantic books, everything under the sun. Huh? And then uh, my passion is also cooking. Huh? And I love to watch Master Chef. <laughs> That's my favorite program. Okay? Okay, so passion for God, but when I'm talking about spiritual passion, it is talking about passion for God and the things of God, like I just told you just now. Okay, so spiritual passion, uh, the, the passion is what we do for God, or the, or the, you know, I told you all the four things, the passion for the word and all that things, okay, the four things. So my spiritual passion, if you ask me, my spiritual passion was teaching. From the time God touched me, from the time I knew Jesus as my personal savior, and later when I came to, uh, after I got married and everything, all that over, and then we came out, the first church that we came to was the church that Pastor Rajan had pioneered in Bhagarajam. And then, there, it all started, my children were very small, all like uh, Sister Cynthia's kids. You know, very small uh, kids. And then God spoke to me, you know, I mean, not God spoke, uh, but they asked that there was a, there's a need for, uh, for Sunday school teacher. So I filled in that need because I wanted my children also to do the word of God. So I quickly said, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll do the teaching. So I was in Sunday school, I was teaching the Sunday school kids. And then I fell in love with teaching. You know, I just loved to teach the Sunday school children and the Sunday school children um, you know, even if it was, of course, during Pastor Rajan's time, it was massive. They, were, they had to take two, two vans to bring the children, so about 60 children, you know, and they, had, they didn't have enough teachers and all that. So then later, God promoted me from a teacher, Sunday school teacher, to a Sunday school superintendent. And then I took charge of the other teachers. I had five teachers with me, and they all, we all worked very well together, you know. So here, what I'm trying to say here is, see, God takes us from one... That was, I knew that that was my calling. And then from there, it was not just in Sunday school after that, God spoke to me and said, why don't you take the Bible study also? So Pastor Rajan's um, other, the other leaders asked me to take a Bible study one day. And then I found that God revealed a lot of things to me even through the Bible study. Then from Bible study, it went to discipleship. Now we are having discipleship level one. And very soon we are going to start discipleship level two for this new year. Praise the Lord, because people are showing passion for the word of God. So here, what I'm trying to say here is that, uh, you know, you, when God calls you to do something, you will know your calling and you will know that, you know, uh, where you're supposed to, in what area you're supposed to serve God. So not only, not only is my passion teaching the word and teaching, um, you know, discipling people and teaching people, Okay, not only that, but I decided this year that I will go to the next level in the Word of God. Last year and the year before that, I always, I, I always told God from the beginning that I will try to memorize your Word and keep it in my heart. So this year, I'm going to go to another level, a, set, a greater level, and I'm, I, and I'm, um, I know what you say, I'm putting my mind to it, and I'm doing it so far so good. I'm taking one psalm, one verse, memorizing it, the next day, reviewing it, memorizing it again, and so that it can come alive in my spirit. So that's the most important thing, to have a passion for the word of God, okay? So passion for God's word is what? 
passion for Jesus because the word itself is Jesus. Hallelujah. You can't separate the two. Okay, here I want to tell, just, I know I've taught this before in the church. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. John chapter 1 and verse 1. Everybody knows that, okay? Yeah. Now the word here is talking about the logos. Logos, okay? Some of you may not know what is logos and some of you may not know um, uh, uh, Rema. Word. So I want to just briefly say that before I come to my text, okay? So the Bible is the passionate love story of God to humanity. Hallelujah. Huh? It, it, and there are 66 books here and all of this, the whole Bible is God's love story to humanity. I love that because God is love. The nature of God is love. You know? And here, what I want to say is that the Bible from Genesis right up to Revelation, the central theme of the Bible, just a little bit huh, so that you will understand what I'm coming to. Why you must be passionate for the word of God. I have to tell this before I can go to exit to so what I'm going to uh, preach. Okay? This is just an uh, introductory to tell you what it is. So right from Genesis right up to Revelation, the center, the central theme is Jesus. Jesus was concealed in the Old Testament and was revealed in the New Testament. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament was 450 years. In the Old Testament, Jesus was concealed in the prophecies. Okay? And Jesus was revealed in the New Testament when he came down to earth 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. Slide 3, yeah? Same, yeah, the same slide. So, Logos, let me tell you, Logos is the written word of God. Written word of God. It's the written word of God, okay? Written word of God. Okay, get that first. Right from Genesis to Genesis, it's the written word of God. Who wrote the word? Holy men of God. It is God breathed. Remember that. That's why it's alive. It is God breathed. It's, it's inspired by God and he breathed his word into holy men like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses, and all these people, they wrote. Because God is spirit, how can God come and write? So he breathed, God breathed into them, and they wrote the scriptures. That is why it is alive, because it's God himself. The word is God himself. Hallelujah. Okay? So the word of God is God revealing himself to man through the Bible. God, how else can God reveal to us? It is through his word. Okay? Now the rhema word. Rhema word means the spoken word of God. Okay? The spoken word of God. And it has to come, the spoken word of God has to come from the Logos. This is the Logos, the word of God. When God speaks to you, and when he speaks to you, and you know it is God speaks a word, words to you, it must come out from here. It must come out from here. Then it becomes a rhema word. It becomes living. It becomes a life. Suppose you are in the sanctuary. Let me give you an example. Suppose you are sitting in the sanctuary, okay? And then, uh, say, worshipping, suddenly you're thinking, ah, this is the year of the rabbit. Huh? God will prosper me. That is word from the flesh. God will not give that kind of word from the Logos. Back or rabbit or... Hmm? Uh, <laughs> okay, what I'm trying to give you an example. But instead, God will give you his word as you're worshipping or as you're reading the word, God will give you the word. You tell me 18, 18. The power of uh, the God will give us God. It is God who gives you power to make wealth. That's the word of God. So when that word comes into your spirit, that is the rhema word of God. Huh? It's, it is uh, it is God who gives us the power to make wealth. Deuteronomy eighteen eighteen. That is from the logos, and it is when it comes into your spirit. When you read the word, suddenly it comes to you like that. The word and God is speaking to you. That is the spoken word of God. The rhema word of God. Got it. Good? Okay, everybody understood? Okay, yes. good. That is why we need to be a passionate, authentic church that represents the heart of God. Okay? Authentic, passionate church for the word representing the heart of God. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question. Okay, huh? here, let me tell you, ask you this question here. Why does the church have to be built? The word of God says, that the, the church that is built on the revelational knowledge of Jesus Christ is the church that is over, going to overcome the gates of hell. Why do you think 
that the church has to be built on the word of God. Why do you think the church has to be built on the spoken word of God? I tell you why. Because Jesus said so. Because Jesus said so. If you want to see the church victorious, the church has to be built on the revelational, revelational, it's a mouthful, revelational, meaning logos and rema word of God. The church has to be built on that. If you want to see us overcoming the gates of hell. Okay, let me tell you, Jesus himself said that. So slide three, huh? say, if you have, uh, if you want to know um, about this uh, thing, about uh, what Jesus said, that it is the uh, revelation uh, knowledge of Jesus Christ, the church has to be built on that. It is in Mat Matthew 16 and 18. Jesus himself said, in Matthew 16 and 18, Jesus was going with his disciples and Jesus asked his disciples, what do men say that I am? Who do men say, not what? Who do men say that I am? So they all, some of the disciples said, uh, well, they say that you are John the Baptist. Some say that you are Elijah. Some say you are some prophet. Then Jesus turns around to Peter. Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter immediately said, you are Jesus, the son, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, don't be too smart. It was not you, you, you who got the revelation. This revelation, that's why Jesus said, it comes from heaven above. It's a divine revelation. Hmm? He said, Jesus, blessed are you, Simon. Jesus, this is what Jesus said to Peter. Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. That means what? What is he talking about? He's talking about the spoken word of God, the, uh, the spoken word of God, the rhema word of God. So Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, it's not from your flesh and blood. It's not, it has got nothing to do with humanity. It has got nothing to do with your uh, five, uh, five physical senses. It's got nothing to do with that. It is divine revelation from above that came into your spirit that you said, you are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. You got it? Good. Okay. So what Jesus is saying here is that Peter, uh, it, is, it is everything, what you said that you are the Son, the son you are Christ, the Son of the living God, it has got nothing to do with humanity. It is to do with divine revelation, Jesus told him. So then what did Jesus say in verse 18? And I say to you, Peter, Jesus goes, verse, all this is in Matthew 16. Huh? So verse 18, he goes to Peter and says, and I say to you, Peter, Jesus points at him. And I say to you, Peter, you know what's the meaning of Peter? Peter means Petros, small rock, small stone. And I say to you, Peter, that upon this rock, talking about Jesus, Jesus is saying about the rock of ages. And I say to you, Peter, and upon this rock, Jesus is talking about himself. And upon this rock, I will build my church, Jesus said. <laughs> and we just said that Jesus is what? Is the word. Try to try to get this thought. Once you get this, then then, then you, you know you know. Be set free. You know. So Jesus said, He is the rock, rock of ages. So he said, It's upon this, it's upon this church that I will build my church. It is upon this rock, Jesus said, that I will build my church. But Peter, your Petros, that means you are a living stone in the big stone. Like all of us are living stone in the big church. Church is Jesus Christ, the word of God. Okay, got it? Okay. That's why Jesus said, you know, Jesus is saying. Then on this rock, and Jesus is talking about himself, on the word, on the logos and the rhema word of God, I will build my church. That is why we need to have the church that it has to be founded uh, on the revelation knowledge of Jesus Christ, of the word of God. It has to be. Because then only you can overcome the gates of hell. And just because Jesus said, unless the, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not overcome it or shall not prevail against it. That means no principality, no power, no spiritual wickedness can attack us if we are built, hallelujah, if we are built on the word of God, if we are built on the rhema word of God, no enemy can attack us. The gates of hell cannot prevail, cannot overcome the church. The church will advance. The church is advancing. Hallelujah. Can you get the thought? Clap for Jesus. Because the church will advance as long as we have placed the 
word, uh, if the church is based on the word of God, the living word of God, the spoken word of God, the gates of hell will not overcome it. Hallelujah. So that is the kind of church the hell cannot overcome. Hell cannot overcome a church that is founded on the revelational, revelational knowledge of Jesus Christ, the Logos and the Rhema word of God. If the church is based, that's why I said we need to be more passionate for the word of God. Because in the word of God is everything. Word of God is everything for us. Hallelujah. The authentic, passionate church is built on the word of God. It's built on the revelation of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Is the church that is cannot be overcome by gates of hell. Hallelujah. Hmm? Okay, here. Yeah. I hope you see how important it is for us to have sincere, authentic, genuine love and passion for the word of God. Because the revelational knowledge of God is actually the revelational knowledge of God, not just the logos, the spoken word of God. When you speak out this word, I told you the spoken word of God must come out from the logos. It must come out from, this, from the word of God. Okay? So here, you must understand that uh, the rep, when we have this revelational knowledge of Jesus Christ, the spoken word of God, the word itself, you know what? You know what you will have? It represents the keys of the kingdom. See what you can do. If only the church has a passion for the word of God, it will do wonders because it represents the keys of the kingdom. You see, here in verse 19, the same Matthew 16 and verse 19, it says, And Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That means... Here is the key. <laughs> it's the key to this is the keys to the kingdom. So whatever you lose on earth, I'm giving you. I'm giving you my name. I'm giving you the authority, and I'm now giving you the keys. Jesus is telling to Peter. Okay, he has given us the keys of the kingdom huh? and the authority in his name to continue his work, in the building of the church. Hallelujah. The keys of the kingdom are for us to overcome what's coming out of hell. Tell me what's coming out of hell. All sickness, uh, wickedness, um, you know, uh, every other thing, everything that is displeasing the God comes out from hell. And how is the church going to overcome unless the church is built on the revelational knowledge of Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. So there's a key in that. There's a, listen carefully. There's a key. I haven't come to my text yet. There's a key in the word of God for every door. That's the keys of the kingdom. For every door, there's a key. Okay? For every door, there's a key. There's a key for the door of addiction. Oh, hallelujah. There's a key for the door of addiction. Okay? There's a key for the door of sickness. There's a key for the door of uncertainty and worry. What's the key? The word Psalms 32 and 8. You know, Psalms 32 and 8, please, please, please be with me. Huh? There's a key from the Bible for every door. The door of uncertainty, door of worry. You know, when my daughter was going to Australia for the first time, you know, I know she was very nervous. She was very frightened because she's going to another country and, you know, we won't be with her. So, uh, but I know how she was feeling and I prayed and, and there was, this was a long time ago, but I want to bring it up. And I prayed and I got the verse, Psalms 32, 8, where God says, I will instruct you and I will, uh, and I will direct you to the path that you should go with my loving eye. I gave it to her. I gave this verse to her. And I said, this is what God told me to do. And today she's, I mean, really can see that she's growing spiritually and all that. But I, I just want to thank God for the key that he gave me so that her nervousness will go off. And you know, her fear will go off. That's the key to the door of sickness. Huh? This is the message. I got a call from Sister Martha. Uh, she was crying over the phone. She said, my eyes are bleeding from behind. She said, you know, some eye problem she had and it's starting to bleed. Uh, then I said, I, I'm actually preparing the message for this Sunday. I, I can't be long with you, but I'm just telling you. And the Spirit of God told me, why don't you just preach, um, practice what you preach by telling her, uh, they're telling her just, Speak the word of God. So I prayed with her and I told her, God, uh, this is God's word. And I gave her uh, Isaiah 53, 5. 
you know, and I just told, spoke to her on the phone and I said, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for iniquities, and the just chastisement of his peace was upon us, and by his stripes you are already healed. I said, hang on to the word, believe the word. And then I prayed with that, and I just said to her, today morning I'm getting a call saying that bleeding has stopped. Hallelujah. I said, praise the Lord, you know, because God's word will never return to him void. It will, it will be sent to accomplish the purpose, and it was accomplished. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Huh? Amen. Okay. So here, there's a key to everything. A key to, to, to the sickness in your body. Huh? God's word is itself is medicine to our body. You know? A help to our bones. Okay. Good. I already said all these all this keys to the doors of fear. Huh? To 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of sound and, uh, and, and sound mind. Power of love and sound mind. Okay. Just start speaking the word and the devil will have to just, the gates of hell cannot overcome you. you cannot overcome whatever you're going through. Whether it's depression, whatever you're going through, the gates of hell cannot overcome the church. Church meaning you and I. Okay? Okay. Hallelujah. There's so many verses. Everything you can find here. Everything that pertains to life, you can find in this book. Hallelujah. So, church, if you only know that the power of the spoken word of God from the Logos, then if you only know the power that is in the spoken word of God from the Logos, then you will be passionate, brothers and sisters, you will be passionate for the word of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You will be passionate. You will be wanting more and more of hearing the word of God. Not, not just hearing reading, dwelling inside the word of God, just reading the word of God, you know, and letting God speak to you. That's his love, love letter to you. you. You read and he speaks to you. He speaks to you. That's the rhema word. Hallelujah. So love the word quite passionately. Okay. Now, I just want to tell you, when Jesus was on earth 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago when Jesus was on earth, he was the word dwelt among us. The word that became flesh. Jesus was 100% man. <coughs> 100% God. He was the word that came and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. So when Jesus spoke, it was with authority. When Jesus spoke, it was with authority because Jesus had the words of eternal life. So people clung. They don't want to eat the food. They clung to the words of Jesus. Why? Because it was life. It was the word among them. They didn't want to go back home. They just wanted to hear Jesus speaking. Hallelujah. And they were just amazed. Okay? They had such passion for his words. And it is by his words, Rema. By his words, he spoke to the leper and he was healed. By his word, he spoke to the blind man and he was healed. By his word, he spoke to Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came, back, came out from the, from the tomb. Okay, after four days. So it was by his word. It is by the spoken word of God. And another example is the creation. In the beginning was the word. No, no, I'm sorry. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you know the earth was void? It was empty? Until God spoke, let there be light. And then light came. God had to speak the word. God himself is the word. God had to speak it out. You understand? It's not enough just reading. You must allow God to speak to your heart. That's the very word of God. Okay, now only we come to our text. Can I have the text please on the board? Jeremiah chapter 1, 4 to 10. I told Brother Jeremiah I'm going to speak about you today. <laughs> see, we're going to see in this text, huh, the book of Jeremiah, a person who has such a passion for the word of God. Okay? He had such a passion for the word of God. We're going to just see how it was that so that so much so that, uh, yeah, wait, wait here. This one is the first verse. But I want to tell you that the passion for the word of God was so much in, in, in Jeremiah that he said, you know what? His word is like fire. Shut up in my bones, he's telling. And, and whatever he says, I, I can't do anything but do it because it's shut up in my bones. Hmm? Like fire, he's telling. Okay. So let me just give you a little bit of uh, background of Prophet Jeremiah, okay? Jeremiah was called by God 
to be a prophet to the nation of Israel. Israel was backsliding as usual, was idolizing, having other idols and doing all kinds of things, was displeasing to God. So God told Jeremiah, you have to go and speak to the nations. Now, verse 1. And Jeremiah, I'll tell you what happened. What He was hesitating to do what God asked him to do. Why? Because he knew the life of a prophet. He knew he had seen prophets before. They, they, they humiliate you, they persecute you, they, 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 they do all kinds of prayer, even they even beat you up, all this kind of so he was hesitating when God said, was one please. Was one. It says what? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. What does it mean? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. What was it? Somebody? Rema. It's the Rema word of God. Because the word came, fell in his spirit. And see, look here. Verse 4. Uh, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, unto me means unto Jeremiah, saying, verse 5, please. Mm, verse 5. Okay. Before, you, you must know this, huh? This one is really, uh, just don't sleep or anything, huh? Uh, just give your whole attention to this. Because it's not every time they're going to speak about passion of, of, of the word of God. So I want to do it and I want you to get it, grasp it and run with it. This 2023, it must be a more intense desire for the word of God. Okay. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, God said to Jeremiah, verse 5, I knew you. Mm. Hallelujah. Before you were born, I sanctified you and I ordained you. Now I want to take line by line. Before God formed us, when we are talking about Jeremiah, we are already talking about us. Before you were formed in a mother's womb, I knew you. That means before you were born, you know, I mean, before you were, you were inside the, uh, I mean, in the womb of your mother, you were not yet in the womb of your mother yet. Huh? Conception didn't take place yet. God is saying, I knew you. That means God knew your complexities. God knew your identity. God knew your individuality. You know that? I tell you, this is something it's just mind-boggling, you know. He said, I knew you. And then he's saying, he's saying, I knew you. And uh, uh, when you were, uh, before you were in your mother's womb. Okay? But then when, he, when you're in your mother's womb, when you he was in the uh, when the child was, when the baby was in the mother's womb, when Jeremiah was in the mother's womb, God said, I formed you in, my, in your mother's womb. Huh? Mm. You see, first thing, I knew you. Even before you were born, even before you were conceived, even before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. I knew everything about you. Then it says, And I formed you. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you, and then I formed you. You know, this is really something you was, you know, I sat down to think about this, you know. You see, I, 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 when it says here, I formed you in a mother's womb before conception took place, even that, even before the embryo was born, he knows our identity and all that. You see, he knows what we are going to be. He knew our, I, our the hair on our head. He knew the color of our hair. He knew the, uh, you know, um, the, the parents that we were going to be born to. God saw you, loved you passionately. I'm going to show, I'm showing you in this line the passionate love of God. Huh? God saw you, loved you, he knew you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb. That means when you were formed in your mother's womb, let me tell you, then God, then the word of God says, I knew you, now I formed you. In your mother's womb, I knitted you fearfully and wonderfully made with loving hands and such love. I had for you. Hallelujah. A passionate love of a God who knitted us in our mother's womb. God was forming you. He was loving you. I want you to catch one more thing here. See, when he was forming you, loving you and forming you in the mother's womb, let me tell you, he was the first person to touch you. <laughs> it is not the doctor. It is not the nurse. It is not your mother. You know, God was the first one to touch you. His love was real. His love, he loved you. He, when he was forming you, even after knowing 
your identity, whether you're a serial killer, you're going to be a serial killer one day, or your, your, all the wickedness you did, all the things that you did, he already knows, but yet, when he formed you in your mother's womb, he did it lovingly, passionately, with so much of love. Hallelujah. And he was, no other human, human hand touched you. It was God who touched you first. That is first love. He touched, you know, when I, when I, when I heard this, when I really, uh, you know, when I take time to understand, I knew you and then I formed you. And, and, and it came to dawn to me that God was the one who touched me first. He formed me, he touched me lovingly. And then I just broke down and cried, you know. You know why? If only I had known this revelational truth when I was, when I was a child and I lost my father at the age of eight and I was always looking for a father figure. If only I had known God as my heavenly father, then I wouldn't have felt so bad. You see? That he was the first one to touch me. He was the first one to love me. What passionate love the father has towards us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, okay, we go from there. He loved us with the first love. Unlimited. And I love this unconditional. Because he knew you before. He knew what you were going to be. All your terrible things that you were doing. And yet he formed you so lovingly, so fearfully, so wonderfully. And he wants us to be his beloved children. Okay, then look at, uh, uh, look at uh, the verse 5 again, please. Not only did he know you, not only did he form you, but he also knows our identity. Look at the verse God says to Jeremiah, I sanctified you and I ordained you prophet to the nations. <laughs> Even before he was born, God already chose him to be there. You see, but he also knows. So not only God knows us, God formed us, he also knows our destiny. What your destiny and mind is going to be, he knows. How it's going to end, he knows. Hallelujah. So these are the four things that God said in that simple one verse, verse 5. Okay, now let's look at what Jeremiah's uh, passion for God's word. Huh? We're going to see. Verse 6. What does Jeremiah say? Please put up verse 6. Uh, just stay with me. Huh? Um, uh, Jeremiah is telling like all of us making excuses. Lord, uh, you know when God called Jeremiah, he was only 20 years old. Very young. So he told God, when God told him all these things, verse 5, verse 6 he's telling, God, I'm only a child. How can I speak to the nations of Israel? How do you think they're going to listen to me? I'm only a child. Like all of us make excuses. I'm only so small. I cannot do all these things. I'm only so old. No, la, leave me out. La. I'm very old already. I cannot do these things. And God says, you've got to do it. Otherwise, that word that God spoke to you will remain in your bones like fire until you do it. That's what happened to Jeremiah. Okay, now you look here. Uh, because why did he say that? He was afraid, I told you. Uh, afraid what prophets, those days, what they do to the prophets. So he was afraid. And see what God says. Verse 7, please. God speaks to Jeremiah again. Stay with me. I'm finishing now. Jeremiah 1 7 says, The Lord said to him, Say not, I'm a child. God is telling you. Don't say you're a child. For you shall go out of, and send, I will send you and I command you to speak. Look at that. I command thee. To, that thou shalt speak. I'm going to give you to speak to the nations. Then you see the word next word. Huh? God is saying that you should speak my word and see that you will return to me. Okay. Verse 8. And also God tells him, verse 8. Also God tells him, I'll deliver you from your enemies. Okay. Then God is telling Jeremiah, don't, you know, uh, it doesn't, I'm saying, this is what we need to know. It doesn't matter who we are, whether we are young, whether we are old, whether we are weaker. You know, it doesn't mean old people cannot be used. It doesn't mean that. God used all the old people in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean Old Testament is all old people. No. In the New Testament, it's about old people. God can use any age. Even as, as small as Cynthia's son, Daniel, also God can use. Huh? So all that matters is who God is. He is the word. It is not about you and I. I cannot speak, I cannot go to read, I cannot do this, I cannot do that. It is not about you. It is about the word that came to you. You stand on that word, you will be able to do it. Okay? There's power in the spoken word. Then you see what God says in verse 9. Verse 9, verse 9. Okay, look there. 
says, the Lord said, he touched Jeremiah's mouth and he said, I'm putting the words, I'm putting my words in your mouth, Jeremiah. You're going to do it. And so the verse 9 says, God placed his hand on Jeremiah's mouth. Okay? Now verse 10. Now look here, and I'm closing. God says to Jeremiah, his destiny. You see, this is his destiny. You saw or not? The whole thing. Destiny. Jeremiah 1 10. Jeremiah, this is what you're going to do. See, I have this day set thee. Ah, this verse 10. Set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root up and pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Hallelujah. 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 See, God has given him the destiny. This is what you're going to do. I put my words in your mouth already. You go and do it. You go and do it. So God's word, as he spoke, Jeremiah says in verse 20, uh, can I have Jeremiah 29? 20 and 9. Uh, see that? But his word was in my heart. Like he said, first he didn't want to do all that things. Then he said, but his word was in my heart. Like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back. I cannot. I have to do it. I have to do what God asked me to do. I can't, I can't keep it away. That's what he said. The word was there all the time. Every time it was reminding him. I knew you. I formed you. I sanctified you. I ordained you. That was the word that came to Jeremiah. That was the living word of God. That's the remember word of God. And you know what Jeremiah's the rest of what you want to know about Jeremiah? That's all about Jeremiah. The rest of it, Jeremiah, because the word had such a passion for the word of God that came to him, he, he uh, for 40 years, he was prophesying to the nations. He was beaten, correct? He was humiliated. He was put in jail. He was uh, tormented. All these things happened to him. But he still stood on the word of God because it was burning inside of his bones. The word of God was burning inside his bones. He had to do what God asked him to do. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hmm? He had been, and yet, he never gave up because why? His passion for the word. Today, you and I, I pray that your passion will be like that for God and his word. Having passion for the word is having passion for God. Hallelujah. The passion for God's word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Okay. And then I want to close with this. Slide four, please. Slide four. Why must we have passion for the word of God? Number one, God's word is like a hammer and fire. A fire and a hammer. It says in verse 23, 9, Jeremiah is saying, huh? It's not thy word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. You see, God's word, why is it important for us to have passion for the word? Because it can tear down certain things in people, not only for people, for your own life also. If you have pride, if you have arrogance, and God's word speaks to you from the word of God, you know, get rid of that arrogance, get rid of the pride. God's word is speaking to you from the scriptures. God, so it tears down, you know, you become humble self. You know, you know, and you start weeping that that was what you were, arrogant, proud, and all that things. And see God's word, just because you read God's word and God's word came like a rhema to you, no more pride, no more arrogance. God took it away, pulled it down, tore it down. Ha, ha, ha. And I was, our rottenness, and our sins in our hearts, our secret sins, he, he takes it, he breaks it down, he tears it down, and then he fills it with the goodness of his son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Number two, his word refines us. Mm. Cleanses us. The word refines us, sanctifies us every day. When we read the word, it sanctifies us, makes us better people. Makes us more and more like his son. That's the goal God has for each one of us. That we can become like his son, Jesus Christ. How to become like his son? We need like refining. We need cleansing by the word. It's only the word that can cleanse you. It's only the word that can refine you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Huh? So here, it sanctifies. And then the word, 
Number two. Second one. Yes. Three things only. Why, why is it important for the word? First thing I told you already is like a fire and like a hammer. Second thing is that the word shows us how to live. Just now, Pastor, Pastor Guna sang that song. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. So, it shows us, the word shows us how to live. I told you how my, my daughter was so fearful and all that. And just that word uh, set her to, to, to be more brave. Huh? For God's word is a commandment. Okay, it instructs us, it rebukes us. You read the word, the grammar word will come. As so you read it, hey, this is what I've been doing, it's the wrong thing to do. So, you know already God is speaking to you. So you won't do it anymore, okay? So it rebukes us, it instructs us, it teaches us the ways of God. We need, we need to give the word of God proper place in our homes. As your children are growing, you must, as a family, come together and read the word. There's power in the spoken word of God, please. Hallelujah. Uh, in our lives, we need guidance and direction in our lives. Hallelujah. Correction, okay? And then 2 Timothy uh, 3, 14 to 17, the last verse, uh, 16, verse 16. All scripture, the word of God, the rhema, the logos, is given by inspiration of God. Remember that. It's not our word. It's God himself. And it is profitable for doctrine. See? Amen. Profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. Hallelujah. God, glory to God. It's profitable means it is powerful. It is powerful. Why? Because it is powerful for evangelization and for salvation. The, 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 uh, uh, I'm not, for, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation. So you need to have the word evangelization and salvation. Then it is also for exhortation. It is also for encouragement. I know I, I'm very thrilled at our ladies' group, you know. They always put uh, uh, things that encourages us, videos to encourage us, and uh, words to encourage one another. This is what we should do as groups. You know, and the ladies grow. I'm really happy that you know. Some sometimes you you you, you want you you are in some kind of problem, and then suddenly one verse comes up in the ladies group, and that is the verse for you. That also is the rema word of God, the word of God from here. Okay, and the last one, the word of God is our GPS, not the GPS to see the direction, huh? But here, GPS stands for what is it? God's people, security, and with this I close. God's people say GPS, God's people's security. This is our security. Our security is on in this book. Okay, not just the logos, it's also the rhema. Simply put that our security is in the life, is based on God, our, uh, on God's word. It's not in our money, secure, cannot be secure, the money cannot be secure, the politics cannot be secure, the military power. But in God and God only. Hallelujah. And, then, and, the, and the last verse I want to say is Luke 4 4. Man shall not live by bread alone. All these things, power, um, uh, money, all this we need. But then you don't live by this alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Hallelujah.